Welcome back to the Clean My Space channel. My name is Melissa Maker. I am an accidental cleaning expert, which means I hate cleaning, but I've been doing it since 2006 professionally, and I know the most efficient and effective ways to get the job done right the first time so you don't waste time. And where's one place we waste time? The dishwasher, trying to figure out where things go and if we can put certain things in there. And the truth is there are many things that cannot go in the dishwasher that perhaps we don't all know about. So that's what I'm gonna cover in today's video. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna give you three extra tips that you can use to keep your dishwasher performing at its peak. I know it's tempting because we use them all the time and who has time to hand wash? But if you are a fan of having insulated beverages, this one was a Christmas gift from friends a couple of years ago. It's our little BFF mug. It does not go in the dishwasher. The reason being is because anytime you put an insulated item in the dishwasher, it affects the vacuum seal and this will not be able to keep your hot sauce and your cold cold. So hand wash. A lot of small kitchen appliances and their associated accessories claim to be dishwasher safe or top rack dishwasher safe. In my experience, I've always found that it wears the item down faster. And let me know if you've had a similar experience in the comments down below. I have had my blender, it's um, a Blendtec blender. I've had it since 2015 and I've had to replace the blender jar three or four times. And you know when I have to start replacing it? It's when I get lazy and I say, eh, I can put it in the dishwasher just this one time. And then I do it again, because it worked fine last time. And then I do it again and again and again. And the next thing I know, my blender stops working. And then I'll call the company and they ask me to do a test and they tell me it's the bottom of the blender jar and did I put it in the dishwasher. Even though it says it's dishwasher safe, over time, these things don't age well when they're put in the dishwasher. So as annoying as it is, these small appliances and small appliance accessories, I will hand wash. I asked for this cast iron pan many years ago as a gift and I've been taking good care of it ever since. Can't you tell? No, seriously, I have. Um, because I don't use soap with it. Because soap would take away the years and years of work that I have put into building up a beautiful patina on this pan. Now, the other thing that can really mess up a, a cast iron item, whether it's a frying pan or anything else, is putting it in the dishwasher. Because it'll take off that patina that you've worked very hard on, but also, cast iron gets rusty. And if you leave it in a dishwasher, say overnight and for several hours, you will pull that item out and there is probably like an 87% chance that you're gonna see rust on it. So this is something that you wanna hand wash. What I do, I take a scrub, I put a little bit of water on it when the pan is warm and I just give it a wipe down. Another thing you can do is just sprinkle some coarse salt on the bottom of the pan after you're finished cooking with it, add a little bit of water and deglaze the pan with a wooden spoon. And what this does is it kind of scrapes things up that shouldn't be there, but it leaves that beautiful oily coating at the bottom. And for the people who kind of panic and say, ooh, that sounds kind of gross, well, don't worry. The next time you heat up your frying pan, it's gonna kill anything that was on there anyway. I don't care what your dishwasher manual says about washing stemware and how many of these little flaps it comes with, I don't trust it. And I'll tell you why. I've washed many of my beautiful wine glasses in the dishwasher, and I've had a few of them just break on me. You know why? Because they're delicate, this is skinny, and if it gets knocked around during the washing process, if something falls over, guess what? You have no control over it, it's broken. That's why we've switched to stemless, <laughs> quite frankly, stemless glassware for our regular casual weeknight wine because you know what you can throw it in the dishwasher and you don't have to worry about it when the friends come over and we're bringing out a nice bottle of wine yes i'll hand wash guys i'm not that lazy and we'll bring out the fancy stuff but truthfully i like putting things in the dishwasher as much as possible which is why i like to have options when i talk about cleaning plastic containers i will often get asked about those white marks that seem to appear on plastic containers that people can never get rid of those are just marks that happen because you're putting your plastic in the dishwasher. It kind of just happens over time. Most of us know we're supposed to put our plastic on the top rack because bottom rack is generally where a heating element is for many dishwashers and that can straight up melt the plastic. I have seen it in my business. It is not pretty. So that's why we rely upon the top rack. But even still, there are reasons why I would not put plastic containers, especially ones that you care about, 
into the dishwasher. Case in point, my daughter's lunch bento box. I hand wash this every day. There was one time, one time where I was like, I'm going to put this little sandwich thing into the top rack of the dishwasher, onto the top rack of the dishwasher because I just want to give myself a break. And look at this. It worked that one time gone. And I, it's just, it's done. I mean, this is, it's life from now on. So that's why I hand wash things that I care about. Things that I don't care about, fine. They can go in the dishwasher. And I've also switched a lot of my containers to glass because I'm sick and tired of my stuff smelling like dishwasher and warping. You might have heard people say, don't put knives in the dishwasher. So let's settle the score. Knives like paring knives, steak knives, you know, things that you don't care so much about but want to make sure you're not going to hurt yourself with, you want to put those facing downward in the cutlery basket. But anything that's too large to go in the cutlery basket that you would have to put on the top rack, I want you to think twice about it and here's why. First of all, if anything knocks around during the dishwashing process, it can dull the very fine edge of the knife. And you know, for an expensive kitchen knife, you don't want that to happen. Second, um, and what's a little bit more worrisome, is if you put the knife in such a way where it starts to hit against the coating on the top rack, it can hack away and get to the metal. And what this causes over time is rust. And then you're gonna notice that there's rust in your dishwasher and it's really gross and it's very hard to repair. The other, other thing you wanna think about is just safety. When you go to unload your dishwasher, if a knife falls, if you accidentally move your hand in such a way, it's just, it's just not good to have a knife in the dishwasher. So do yourself a favor and hand wash your beautiful big knives and your small ones, leave it for the cutlery basket. If you've been upping your efforts to avoid disposables, then you probably have reusable straws and a lot of these insulated mugs or travel mugs or what have you, water bottles, you know, anything to port your liquids around. Well, here's the thing. It's very easy to toss all the stuff in the dishwasher, except for the fact that these pick up the flavor. You know that dishwasher flavor? And it totally markedly affects the flavor of whatever it is that you're drinking. Water, coffee, tea, juice, smoothie, you name it. It doesn't taste good. So what I've decided to do is to spend extra time just hand washing these things. And another hot tip is to use an unscented dish soap. That way these don't pick up even the scent of like frosty meadows or tropical fruits or anything like that. You just want it plain and simple so that you don't have any soapy or dishwashery flavor going into your mouth and into your olfactory receptors when you're just trying to enjoy a drink. Something I know a lot of people do is they put their sponges in the dishwasher. Now, a couple things to know about this. First of all, you can never get a cellulose style sponge perfectly clean and bacteria free. Um, that has been proven by tests done by the very companies that produce these. Cellulose basically means it's like the holy, holy structure um, that exists within the sponge material. The other reason you don't want to do that is because the high temperatures melt the glue that binds the webbing to the sponge, rendering your sponge eventually useless. And now three surefire ways that you can get your dishwasher working better. First, don't overload it. I know it's tempting. I know. But trust me on this one, the more you shove into your dishwasher, the less effective it can be. You also want to make sure that any arm of your dishwasher can do a full rotation. Next, you want to make sure you're using a great detergent. While I would love to use like an eco green detergent, I have tested them. They just don't work as well as traditional detergents. And you know what's not eco-friendly? Having to re-hand wash something or rerun a load. And finally, you want to make sure that you're cleaning your dishwasher on a fairly regular basis because going back to my second point, if your dishwasher is not giving you clean dishes, you're just going to waste more time and more energy and more water recleaning those dishes. So that means getting into the filter, giving it a scrub and using a dishwasher cleaning tab once a month, once a quarter, depending on how frequently you use your machine to maintain it. Something that really frustrated me, and I know this gets so many people about cleaning, is it seems like the job can be never ending. So if you find yourself cleaning the same surface multiple times, I want you to rethink how you're doing the cleaning. Specifically, 
First, you wanna make sure you're pre-treating a dirty surface so that you don't have to sit there and scrub the same area for like two minutes to get it clean. Second, you only wanna clean a surface once. If you find yourself cleaning it and then going back to it, adding more product, cleaning again, or just not paying attention to what you've cleaned, then you're gonna be wasting time. So if you approach this strategically, you pre-treat the surface so that the product does the job and you don't have to, and you follow a pattern, the S pattern, working your way around the room from top to bottom, left to right, blah, blah, blah. It's all the stuff in the three wave system. You are not going to re-clean a surface and you are going to save time cleaning. Before you start vacuuming, empty your vacuum canister because if you try to vacuum with a full canister, your vacuum will not vacuum. I don't know how many times I said vacuum in a sentence, but the idea is you want an empty vacuum before you get to work or else your vacuum will not suck. So it'll suck. In the professional cleaning world, there is what's known as dry cleaning, not laundry, but dry cleaning, no product, and wet cleaning with product, cloth tool being wet. If you attack a dusty surface with a wet cloth, so if you start with wet cleaning, you are gonna have way more mess on your hand. So what you always want to do whenever you're approaching any surface, whether it's a kitchen counter or a mantle, you wanna make sure that you're doing your dry cleaning first. So I like to kind of quickly dust off with a microfiber cloth, my kitchen counter or my mantle, let any of the stuff that's stuck on the surface easily come off on my cloth, get swept onto the floor because it's gonna be cleaned up anyway. And then I follow through with my wet cleaning. That way I can lift up any dirt, fingerprints, grease, etc., with my cloth. If I start with the wet cleaning, it's way more work for me in the long run. This only ever has to happen to you once as a professional cleaner for you to never want it to happen again, either in your own home or anyone else's. And that is getting a stain on a surface from a product that you're using. It's rough because if it happens on a natural stone surface, for example, it can cost into the thousands to fix that. So the way to solve this is to use what I call a coaster. Just find something, whether it's a plastic plate, a plastic bag, or anything that you can easily port around, even a cleaning caddy, where you can replace your cleaning products and tools at all times. A, to avoid any spilling or leakage, but B, to avoid any staining. And the same principle goes for when you're carrying around a mop bucket. You wanna make sure that you're always putting a coaster down, whether it's a large towel, like for example, the Maker's Clean Waffle Weave Towel, um, that can easily absorb moisture so that you're not causing any potential damage to the floor, specifically if it's a hard floor surface. There's this funny meme that I've seen on Instagram that says that stupid walk that you do after you've just mopped the floor and you're trying to get out of a room, or I'm paraphrasing. But we all know that little twinkle toes walk that we've done before when we realize we have mopped ourselves into the exact corner that we shouldn't be in in a room we've just finished cleaning, which is why you should always orient yourself to the opposite of the exit point of the room before you start mopping. That way you mop yourself, vacuum yourself, sweep yourself out of the room instead of into the corner. You see, I have a cleaning company and when I started that company, I had to learn how to clean from the ground up and I found myself making a very big mistake that was costing me time and wasting product and I wasn't getting the results that I needed. So in this video, I wanna tell you what that mistake is and I wanna show you how by correcting that mistake, you can up your cleaning game, get better results in less time and use less product. When I talk about dwell time, this is specifically what I mean applying the correct product, that's the P part of the equation, to the surface to deal with whatever is dirtying up that surface. So that's why it's really important to understand the varying products and of course the surfaces that you're trying to clean. What people forget is that when they just spray a product on, it can't work instantaneously, it needs time. It needs dwell time and that's exactly what dwell time is. It's the time it takes for the product to dig in and do its work so that you don't have to work as hard. Products are incredible. We just have to give them the opportunity to shine. 
Let's say you've got some toothpaste splatters on your bathroom counter or some spilled jam on the counter in your kitchen and it's kind of dried. If you spray a little bit of all-purpose cleaner on the appropriate product for this surface and then wipe it off right away, you probably won't get rid of any of it. Instead, what you'll do is you'll spray the product on, you'll work your way around the rest of the room for a couple of minutes, and then after about two minutes, three minutes, you can come back and wipe the surface down. The really important thing with dwell time, and this is across the board, is you always want your surface to be wet. So you're gonna spray liberally. I know we've talked a lot about disinfecting over the past couple of years, but disinfecting has a lot to do with dwell time because when we watch a TV commercial and we learn about a new disinfectant, that company has about 30 seconds to explain to us everything they need to say about the product. But we can't learn how to use the product in a TV commercial because they don't teach us about dwell time, but the back of the package will. And if you read the back of a disinfecting product, you will see that you actually need to let that product sit wet on a surface for anywhere between two minutes all the way up to 10 minutes in order for it to kill the germs on the surface. Now again, this comes down to selecting the right product for the surface, but at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that the money that we're spending on the disinfectant is actually not going to waste and it's doing its job. In order for this to be the case, learn how to use the product properly, use the right amount of dwell time. Stain removal is both an art and a science, but one thing I can say for sure is that you've got to treat your stain really quick and then you have to use the right product and allow it to sit for a couple of minutes before you launder so that the product can do its job. And if you're using something like an enzyme-based cleaner, you might want to let it sit for a little bit longer so that that product can really work. If you spray a product on and chuck your garment right into the washing machine afterward, the product hasn't really had a chance to break that stain down, break those bonds, lift the dirt to the surface, and prime the garment to release the stain. So the next time you go ahead and treat a stain, just give the product a few minutes before you turn on your machine. When we're dealing with a heavy duty mess, whether it's a large buildup of soap scum or hard water stains in the bathroom or a super greasy backsplash stove or overhead exhaust in the kitchen, this work can feel really overwhelming. And what I see people do is spin their wheels. I don't like to work hard when I clean. And I know that if I use the right product, the right tool and the right technique, I actually don't have to. So when I clean these heavy duty areas, I like to work smart and this is what I do. I clear that area, I choose the right product, so I level up, I use something that's more applicable for heavy duty work and I spray that on the surface. I spray it on liberally, like I hose it down. I don't waste product, but the goal is that you don't want that surface to dry before you get back to it. If the surface is dry, the product can't do its thing. So sometimes if I know it needs like 10 minutes, I might come back to it, respray it a little bit, but then at the end of that 10 minute period, when I hit it up with whatever cleaning tool I'm using, that schmutz comes right off. I don't have to scrub. I don't need to sweat. I don't need to work too hard because I've let the product do its thing. And that's how I like to clean and that's how I want you to clean. I wanna make a distinction here because I know I just talked about being very liberal with your product application and you might be thinking, yeah, but that's gonna waste money. Here's the thing, sometimes you have to apply a lot of product to get the job done. But where product gets wasted is when you apply the product, wipe it off quickly, notice that the work hasn't been done, and then you have to apply the product again, then you wipe it off again quickly, and then you go through that wasting cycle of reapplying and wiping. It wastes product and it wastes time. The other thing, and you can learn more about this in our 50 DIY Cleaners ebook, is you can make a lot of these very effective products yourself for way less than the price of a store-bought product. And today, I wanna to talk to you about cleaning glass and mirrors and flat screens because sure, they sound easy to clean, but really and truly there are some products, tools, and techniques that you need to know about so that you can get the job done efficiently, effectively, with less time, and without ruining anything. So let's do this. So rather than buying a store-bought glass cleaner, I whip my own up. I use equal parts water and white vinegar, so here I'm using a cup and a cup. 
I'm also adding five drops of peppermint essential oils because it just smells nice. Now, the technique that I'm using is I'm spraying the entire mirror fairly liberally with the product. I'm not holding back, but I'm also not flooding it. I'll wait just a sec, and then I'm using my microfiber cloth, my glass and mirror microfiber cloth here. I folded it up into quarters. It just makes it easier to handle, and it gets you an, a more even finish. And then I'm using the S pattern, starting from the top, working my way to the bottom. And this is a huge mirror, so I'm breaking it into sections, starting with the left side and then moving my way over to the right side. Now we do get asked about using essential oils in glass cleaners and if you will get streaks on the mirror because there's a bit of glass, uh, there's a bit of oil in the product, not going to happen. You know, five little drops of essential oils won't show up on your mirrors, won't leave streaks and certainly won't ruin a microfiber cloth. One other thing I want to point out when you're cleaning a mirror is to make sure that you don't let the little area at the bottom catch any drips. You know, some's gonna get in there while it's you know being cleaned, but make sure that when you're done, you do a nice finishing wipe at the bottom. If you don't do that over time, it can really age and kind of rust your mirror. Before we move on, I have to tell you that I have been using these DIY glass and window and mirror cleaning recipes since I started my cleaning business back in 2006. It has saved me so much money. And that brings me to a common question, which is, are you on team Windex and paper towel? or are you on team DIY and microfiber cloth? Let me know what you do in the comments down below. While water and vinegar is a very effective glass cleaner, sometimes you need to level up a little bit. So a perfect example of heavy duty glass cleaning would be a glass panel in a home with children or pets. Now, a lot of uh, friends and family were very surprised when we chose this because they said, you're gonna be cleaning it all the time but I know how to clean it, so it's not that bad. But yeah, the truth is my daughter does get her handprints all over here and it does get quite messy. So the secret sauce that I'm using to clean, uh, you can see it looks a little bit milky, is the exact same recipe as the regular glass cleaner. So equal parts water and white vinegar, five drops of peppermint essential oils, which was totally optional. But to it, I added a tablespoon of cornstarch. Now cornstarch is interesting because it acts as the this super, super, super fine abrasive that we can use. And when I say abrasive, I more mean it can like lift dirt off a surface, but it absolutely will not scratch glass, which is why it's so unique and so useful for this particular application. Anything in my house that has a flat screen has fingerprints. My tablet looks disgusting right now and this phone i mean laptops you name it it's got fingerprints and marks and these surfaces need to be cleaned fairly regularly but we've also been told we're not supposed to use product on these surfaces so what we do know is that if we use product it can remove some of the important coatings that these surfaces have it can also leave permanent marks so you want to make sure you're using them something that is safe Moreover, you wanna make sure that you're using a flat weave cloth, like either an optical cloth, like what I have here, which is just the smaller version, also great for glasses, or the bigger version, our glass and electronics cloth. This also goes for television screens. The reason you wanna use something that's flat is because it can't hold on to any debris, so it will not scratch any of these surfaces. I've done a lot of research and when I do research, I just call manufacturers directly and I get them to shoot straight with me. So I called Apple and I said, help me understand how to clean these screens properly. And they said, in no uncertain terms, you can use equal parts water and rubbing alcohol to clean our electronics. But the way to do it, and I've been saying this for years, is to spray your recipe onto your cloth so it should feel about as damp as a sneeze. And if it feels too wet, you can kind of tap it off on your hand before you clean the surface. You never spray the electronic item directly. So in here, I've already got half of this little teeny tiny bottle filled up with water. I'm going to fill the rest up with rubbing alcohol. So I'll shake this up, give it a little spritz, tap it off on the back of my hand. That is just enough. I'll start at the top using the S pattern, work my way to the bottom, and 
Almost immediately, it takes off dirt, fingerprints, you name it, it's gone. Years ago, uh, I asked a woman who worked at a janitorial supply company what the best way was to do this. And she said, quite simply, double-sided squeegee, hot water, vinegar, dish soap, rectangular bucket. That has not failed me. And I'm gonna show you exactly what to do. So first, get a bucket. I'm planning to use about two gallons of water. That's so I can dunk my squeegee in. So the recipe that I'm using is for one gallon, so just level it up depending on how much you're going to be using for your windows. So it's one gallon of hot water, one cup of white vinegar, and a teaspoon of dish soap. Mix that all together, and then dunk your squeegee in. Let it really get nice and saturated. The squeegee I'm using here, this is a double-sided squeegee, so this kind of has like an absorbent pad and a microfiber exterior, which is great for picking up dirt and also depositing liquid onto the glass surface. And then I'll flip it over, repeating my steps, working my way from top to bottom, left to right, swiping it clean with this rubber squeegee. Now, if this for whatever reason gets nicked, kind of like a windshield wiper blade, you can easily replace this rubber part, which makes this tool something that you will have uh, for quite a while. It's a really good investment piece and it will keep your exterior windows and glass looking amazing. One chunk of glass we didn't cover how to clean in this video was that glass shower door or panel in a bathroom, but I've got a whole video on that. You can check it out right here. If you want to support the Clean My Space channel, of course you can do so by subscribing and by also checking out makersclean.com where those great optical and glass and mirror cloths are on sale right now, makersclean.com. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.